Hello, everyone. This is Steve Gorin, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Loan Guarantees, Debt and Capital Structure, Ordinary Income on Sale of Business. And I'm delighted to be joined today with my partner, Marikita Barbieri. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, uh, we'll, we'll try to answer later via email. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. We encourage you to download any resources or links you may find useful. Um, and of course, you should have my, my newsletter uh, as well, which has the articles that are the basis for this. Um, you can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 hours of general CLE credit and in Missouri for 1.8 hours of general CLE credit. The webinar is also CLE accredited in New York for 1.5 hour of experience and transitions credit. 1.5 hour of general CLE credit in Texas is pending. We award CLE based on, the, on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. Due to changes in jurisdiction requirements, you will notice that we are no longer using automated pop-up attendance checks. As required, we will display secret words in two multiple choice polls during the webinar. You will be required to select today's secret word from a multiple choice list. Please respond to these two polls to demonstrate your continued engagement and to earn your full CLD credit. We value your opinions and appreciate your participation in the course. Okay, so, so as you know from, from the title, you know, what, what we're generally talking about, and we will go into details in each section. So the materials, you'd have the slides, the newsletter articles, which link to the page on the big PDF supporting the article. And, and then I have a, a few thousand page PDF, which can be downloaded from the link in the yellow box in the middle of the newsletter. So for those of you who have, who have downloaded it, the, the big PDF, if you wanted to keep it open, you certainly are welcome to. And um, this slide four explains how to uh, navigate between the slides and the big PDF. You'll, you'll see the slides has a, has a cross reference, which I'll point out to you in the next slide. And, and so this shows you how to do it, but certainly encourage you to do it afterwards. Uh, we will have uh, a recording available that, and you'll have a, a link to it that will that will go go out to you, so you can always uh, rewatch anything if you if you um, if we went too fast on anything. Okay, so you can loan guarantees is is for Marquita, but you'll see up there in the slide that three B one A double I. That's the cross reference to the big PDF I was talking about. Marquita, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining Steve today, so thank you for having me. I'll be kicking us off with the basics of legal, uh, legal basics of the loan guarantees, and then Steve will chime in at the middle and finish us out on this topic. So let's get started. Starting off with the very basic information that you probably already know, but wanted to make sure we covered it. A guarantee is a legal promise made by a third party, typically called that guarantor, sometimes called a surety, to cover a borrower's debt or other types of liability uh, in case of the borrower's default. The borrower is required to pay the cost uh, and all of the payments due uh, if the borrower fails to pay, and then the borrower is required to repay the guarantor any of those funds that the guarantor pays on the borrower's behalf. And this second bullet point is a key point that will permeate this portion of the presentation, as this one sometimes is hard to prove. We see a lot of family uh, guarantors, and sometimes you'll see as we go forward here, that's a key place uh, that we'll spend time on in this presentation. As mentioned, that, uh, hold on, that didn't go where I wanted it to go. There we go. Uh, the elements here of a guarantee are that a lender, uh, who's not necessarily the guarantor, loans money to the borrower, 
the guarantor promises to pay part or all of that loan. Again, a guarantee can be limited or unlimited. Uh, it depends on what that paperwork says. Uh, and it is at some point uh, there is a chance that the lender might be collecting from the guarantor again if that borrower fails to be able to pay. The guarantor steps into the lender's shoes with respect to that amount that the guarantor will pay. This is a, a subrogation right, very similar to insurance, where this is a situation where the substitution of a person is in the place of another person with a lawful claim. And therefore, the guarantor can then impose on the borrower the amounts that the borrower originally owed to the lender. Using that subrogation right, that guarantor can attempt to collect from the borrower as if it were the lender. Of course, the guarantor is out of pocket for the amounts not collected for the borrower. Uh, that also includes collection expenses. Uh, those are typically included in a loan document and given to the lender. Again, that the guarantor gets to step into the shoes of that lender and take all of the rights to make sure that the collection of the debt is also paid for if the borrower defaults and the guarantor has to step in. There's three ways that we see guarantees come to light. Uh, that there are, you know, as, as Steve has it titled here, three paradigms, three patterns, three ways that a guarantee can manifest itself. And we have those here up on the slide. That after the borrower defaults, the lender first goes to the borrower, knocks on the door, says, let's, let's pay up here, you have defaulted. If that does not work, the lender can go straight to the guarantor for those default payments. There's sometimes there's some steps in between, but often not. There's usually a heavy duty loan document that waives rights of notice and waives other uh, opportunities to pay. And if the borrower has already waived those, uh, the guarantor is up next in the line to pay. Then the other paradigm is that after a borrower defaults, the lender then collects from either or both the borrower or the guarantor. Uh, so the lender can go after both equally, uh, and, and again, the loan documents might be dictating how that can work, but the lender can go after both. The third method that this guarantee can come to life is that a guarantor is listed as a co-borrower. That, in that case, the guarantor is a true borrower um, in, in certain state law cases especially. I'll spend a little more time on that. The main borrower, though, is still expected to make the initial payments, but the lender can treat the guarantor as a co-borrower at any time and make that guarantor pay. I want to mention briefly here that you know, subrogation and the ability to, for this co-borrower situation in the last bullet point, there are state law considerations to take into effect here. There are significant state law distinctions, um, and certain states truly have um, a, a very systematic and defined way to identify a co-borrower under a loan versus a guarantor. So be sure to keep in mind any state law considerations uh, as you look at that third paradigm in your practice. Nonetheless, all three ways that the guarantee can come to life have the same tax consequences. Because co-borrowing on its face makes the guarantor legally a co-borrower, Additional documentation or course of dealing is required to distinguish that guarantor, that guarantee, from a true co-borrower joint loan situation, as just mentioned. Very detailed uh, distinctions inside loan documents and, again, state law overlay to make sure you're accounting for uh, various states that have distinctive uh, language that must be added to distinguish the guarantor from a co-borrower. True joint debtors can change uh, into a guarantee if there is an assumption of all the obligations of the borrower. Uh, so that may also be language that is key to review determining what type of guarantor and what type of relationship the guarantor should have to the loan arrangement. The guarantor subrogation right is a consideration for the guarantee. Um, we often see the ability for a lender to, you know, want to be compelled to make the loan. Uh, so these are also situations where the guarantor has to say, I want to be able to step into the shoes of the lender if I'm going to volunteer to be a guarantor. 
for tax purposes and for really determining who a guarantor is, that guarantor must prove uh, that there was an intent and is an intent to enforce the guarantor's subrogation right in cases of, of future collection from the guarantor. This can be tricky, um, proving the intent objectively, um, analyzing whether the guarantor would really be expected to force the borrower to repay the loan, uh, for the lender to also be doing that analysis at the front end. These are uh, facts and circumstances situations where, again, depending on whether it's a family situation um, or another close relationship versus an arm's length third party relationship, can make an impact on proving the intent and proving the analysis as to whether there was a reasonable expectation for that borrower to repay the loan, not only to the lender, but to the guarantor. With that, I'll turn it over to Steve to start hitting the tax sections uh, that are relevant to this analysis. Steve? Thank you very much, Marquita. So from an estate and gift tax viewpoint, uh, you know, what, what, does, what is required here besides, I mean, you need to, you need to have the, those proofs that, we, that Marquita just talked about, um, but, you know, how does, how does that all, you know, what's, what's the law for, for, for that? So, you know, Code Section 7872 is what lets us use the AFR in the state and gift tax purposes, uh, and, and the AFR is based on uh, on government obligation, which of course is considered to be uh, totally totally risk free. And and in the appraisal profession, those obligations are the benchmark for risk risk free um, rates of return. And and then appraisers will add various risk factors to determine an appropriate discount rate or required rate of return. Ordinarily, when you when you figure out, uh, you know, like for example, valuing a business as cash flow. Um, so, so co under Code Section 7872, loans are deemed to charge adequate interest if they charge interest based on the risk-free loan. So, 7872 is really departing um, from from the idea that you have to have, you know, every single safeguard in here to make it be the same as a risk-free loan because uh, the 7872 applies to borrowers who are not the U.S. government and places no qualifications whatsoever on who may use it. So, so credit risk um, is not taken into account in, in determining the adequacy of the interest. So, you know, banks, they'll charge a higher interest rate if the, if the uh, borrower is more risky. Uh, but from a viewpoint of a state and gift tax, Credit risk is is not taken into account uh, when you figure out what the interest rate should be, and and again the interest rates refer back um, under the under code section seventy twelve seventy one to twelve seventy five, so twelve seventy seventy two refers to the AFR which is under twelve seventy four, so we need to look at um, if there are any credit risk issues that go along with with using the AFR that might be embedded into the definition of AFR. You know, what, what, what might those be? So in determining whether to get the effect to a, a schedule, say, the payments, um, the regulations ignore the possibility of non-payment due to default, insolvency, or similar circumstances, unless the lending transaction does not reflect honestly dealing uh, and the holder does not intend to enforce the remedies or other terms or conditions. Um, so, basically, if you structure a loan with terms that reflect arm's length dealing, other than interest rate being the AFR, the only remaining issue is whether the holder intends to enforce remedies and other terms and conditions. Now, the Supreme Court case Dickman uh, talked about the idea of an interest-free loan as having gift tax consequences. Uh, and uh, and so you know basically we we need to look at you know the case the case law that has evolved and the case law that has evolved before and after that Dickman case uh, are pretty consistent with each other. Okay, so compare loan guarantees to back-to-back -back loans. Uh, so if you had a back-to-back -back loan, the person whose credit capacity 
is to be used, borrows from the commercial lender, then loans the proceeds to ultimate borrower. So I'm referring to this, uh, the person who borrows from the, from the commercial, from the bank as a credit intermediary. But that person is, is, is really uh, supplying their, their own credit directly to the bank and then turning around and loaning it back to the borrower. So the borrower grants a security interest to the credit intermediary, and then the credit intermediary then assigns uh, that collateral to the lender. So, so basically, a back-to-back -back loan is in many ways similar to a guarantee uh, in that the borrower is, uh, the ultimate borrower is providing a security interest and that security interest does get back to the commercial lender. Uh, and in the guarantee, that's, that's more of a direct thing. And a back-to-back -back loan, uh, that's indirect. So the back-to-back -back mechanism is not just something that you could use for estate planning, um, but in fact, in just regular income tax planning, uh, when an S corporation wants an S corporation shareholder wants to get basis to uh, to uh, against which to deduct the corporation's uh, debt finance losses, uh, then you can't just have the uh, the S corp borrow from the bank and have the shareholder guarantee. That does not count as something that gives basis to the shareholder. Rather, the basis need the the shareholder needs to borrow from the bank and and then loan the money to the corporation and then that gives the, the shareholder basis. So nothing in code section 7872 looks to the source of the lender's fund. So if we do a back-to-back -back loan and the credit intermediary might be, you know, for example, you know, mom or dad um, who's facilitating getting money to say son or daughter. And so uh, mom or dad can loan to son or daughter at the 78-72 rate, and uh, you know as, as long as there's a genuine you know intent to repay, you know it's, it's reasonably expected to repay, uh, then then that's fine, and it doesn't matter how mom or dad gets that money to loan to the to, to son or daughter. So. One of the things that can happen is that in my example of, of mom or dad facilitating this, this loan, mom or dad can borrow from a bank at commercial rates and then turn around and loan the money to son or daughter at the AFR. So, uh, so there's no problem at all with that. And Code Section 872 doesn't count that as a gift. So if mom or dad are paying, you know, six percent interest to the bank, and they're turning around and charging son or daughter four percent interest, uh, that's perfectly fine. That's not a gift under Code Section 872. Um, even though mom or dad is actually paying money to the bank extra out of pocket to facilitate this loan. So. Uh, you know, people are, are looking to see whether a guarantee is a gift or not. Uh, I would say that a guarantee is actually less out of pocket for mom or dad than the back to back loan that I'm describing is. So, furthermore, this back to back loan, mom or dad are taking on more risk than a traditional guarantee because mom or dad are independently and separately paying the bank. Uh, and and if son or daughter does not pay back to mom or dad, uh, mom or dad is still on the hook for paying the bank. So uh, from, a, from the viewpoint of, correcting, of, of collecting things, the back-to-back -back loan is a lot more risky for mom or dad. So from my perspective, because the interest arbitrage and financial risk that, that the, uh, the mom or dad uh, incur, um, you know, they, they exceed the cost and risk assumed by a guarantor. 
and that's not a gift. So I think that Code Section 7872 inherently means that a loan guarantee does not constitute a gift. Uh, but again, objectively, the guarantor must prove a reasonable expectation that the borrower would repay the loan and that the guarantee was merely to bridge the gap between a reduced risk loan and the risks inherent in loaning to that particular borrower. So mom or dad have to prove that they intended to collect from son and daughter and they were just helping son or daughter get that credit. Another thing is administratively, mom or dad would have to you know, be involved directly with the, with the lender every, you know, every month and making the repayment. Uh, and, uh, and whereas with the loan guarantee, mom or dad can just sit back and, and do nothing until the, until the, you know, the bank taps on mom or dad's shoulder. So I think that there's a pretty good business reason for mom or dad wanting to be a guarantor instead of being a credit intermediary in the back-to-back -back loan. Um, furthermore, enforcing loans to family members can be really disruptive in the family, and having the bank in there helps out. Um, making the borrower deal with the bank injects formality to the process and increases the likelihood of payment. So every once in a while, a client will ask me about the possibility of loaning to a friend. So my first question to them is, uh, if you didn't get repaid, would that ruin the friendship? Uh, and, and also, can you afford to take that risk that it doesn't get paid? Uh, and, and they recognize the issues with that. Uh, so what I suggest to, those, to the people is, to the client is, um, tell the friend, hey, um, I'm not willing to loan you the money, but I will guarantee a bank loan. Um, so then, you know that that way that way the the bank is the one who, you know, the the, the big bad boy collecting uh, the the money, and and the client steps in only if the friend defaults, uh, and then the the friend you know knows that they some, something's happened really bad, and it, it's not just that they borrowed from. Uh, from their you know from the client, so those questions uh, you know usually put the kibosh on the friend's request. So again, relative to a back-to-back -back loan, the loan guarantee seems to me to have a strong non-business reason. So now we're going to go on to our our first polling question. Uh, today's first secret word is estate. Please select the correct secret word below. Okay, enough people have answered. We're gonna we're good to move on. So, income tax issues. So, the guarantee is not considered to be a payment for income tax purposes. Instead, when the lender forces the guarantor to make a payment, the actual payment is a loan from the guarantor to, to the borrower. You know, as Marquita said, the the guarantor has a subrogation right and and steps into the shoes of the lender. So. So the payment under the guarantee, under the guarantee is, is a loan from the guarantor to the borrower. The guarantee is not considered to be a payment for income tax purposes. Instead, when the lender forces the guarantor to make a payment, actual payment is a loan from the guarantor to the borrower. So uh, I did do a TCLE on January 25th, discussing guarantees to support pass-through losses and, and recognizing the uh, very low risk uh, guarantee.
Okay, so when the guarantor becomes primarily liable on a debt and the debt is later forgiven, the, for, the forgiveness does not constitute cancellation of indebtedness income. Um, that's because merely providing the guarantee does not increase the guarantor's assets. So from an, from an income tax viewpoint, the, the guarantor uh, uh, having, having the guarantor's obligations satisfied doesn't count as anything. Um, that's that's the general rule in um, in my prior TCLE. I also mentioned how when you have a partnership, uh, the uh, a guarantee can change the debt allocation, and so being relieved of the guarantee of a partnership that um, could shift the liabilities and could have some tax consequences. But I, I'm not going to get into that here. You can go back and listen to that other TCLE. So. Um, so again, a gas, cash basis guarantor does not make a, a deductible payment when, um, if the guarantor issues a note to the lender, because that makes it be just kind of like the co-borrower scenario that, that we had before, where the, you're still looking for for payments from the borrower generally, but uh, but the guarantor might be issuing a note to kind of step up the the, the security on the guarantee. So you might have one of those first two guarantees that Marquita pointed out and the 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 debate becomes uncomfortable with the situation and says I want your personal note. So issuing the personal note makes it be just like that co borrower scenario, but it still is a guarantee uh for for tax purposes until um until you know it gets paid out with actual cash. So whether a corporation may get may deduct Guarantee fees paid to shareholders. And I have a, a list of items here on slide 27, um, and you can go through those yourself. So the, uh, the slides will be emailed to everybody at the end of the webinar. If, if you uh, don't see them, um, they, they, they are, the correct slides are uploaded now. Uh, so, uh, in terms of taking a bad debt loss, only bona fide debt qualifies to get that um, bad debt deduction. And when any non-business debt becomes uh, held by a non-corporate taxpayer becomes wholly worthless within the taxable year, um, you, there, that's a short-term capital loss. When part of all of the debt, which is not security, is not a non-business debt, becomes worthless, the taxpayer holding the debt can deduct the worthless portion if the taxpayer charges off the loan. Um, and uh, the business bad debt would be deductible only if the taxpayer was engaged in a trade or business and the debt was proximately related to that trade or business. Um, and whether the debt was a, has a proximate relationship to the taxpayer's trade or business turns on the taxpayer's uh, dominant motivation in making a loan. And um, you can look again. All the support for this is in 3G4 AIII in the big PDF. Okay, so um, I'm going to discuss now. Moving on to the next topic, which is debt in the capital structure. So, a recent in a recent case, um, debt that had bonus interest on it. We'll talk about what the bonus interest was. Um, was uh, considered to be actual interest, and uh, even though the this bonus interest was paid when the secured asset was sold, so it was it was counted as, as even though you might view it as since it's based on the secured asset being sold, you might view it as equity in that secured asset, but no, it was viewed as as a loan. We'll get into that, and then I'll talk about limitations on deducting business interest. And then I'll talk about whether an arrangement is business or something else, whether that arrangement is by form, a, a loan, a partnership, or a trust. So whether things can get recharacterized. Okay, in a recent case that I just mentioned, a 2022 case, a Dice versus Commissioner, um, here was the deal. The loan was very was pretty standard, but it has an equity kicker in the form of appreciation interest. 50% of the appreciation and value from the time of the loan to the time of this of the of the um, termination event uh, would be payable to the lender. 
And the termination event would be um, if the property was sold or the loan was terminated, then that's when depreciation interest would be due. And IRS said, hey, 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 sharing this loan makes it look like a partnership. That's not really deductible interest. The tax court held that everything about the loan was totally standard for a loan. And when you look at the at the at this equity kicker, this this you know 50% of the appreciation, that equity kicker did not change the loan's um, nature uh, of itself because it was fundamentally a relationship between the borrower and the lender. I mean, the lender did not intend to take any risk at all, and did a, did everything in form um, and substance to be uh, to be a lender. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll show those what those uh, factors are. So. Having this equity kicker did not change the loan's nature, and they and this equity kicker, this bonus interest, did not constitute a standalone equity interest. Uh, the tax court emphasized the lender would have no downside risk that an equity owner would have uh, relative to the risk that the lenders normally take. So the loan was secured; they went through like everything that any lender would always do. And then the tax court went through the, an exercise of examining eight factors from Luna versus Commissioner, which is when you distinguish a partnership from some other contractual relationship. So was this contractual relationship what it looks like on its face, or was it a partnership in substance? So, uh, so the, here are the factors, the parties' agreement and conduct in executing the terms, um, the contributions everybody made to the venture, the party's control over income and capital and the right of each to make withdrawals. So it's not like um, the lender would would tell the the, the borrower uh, what you know what to do with the property, how to maintain it, you know how to rent it out, how to use it, you know anything like that. The, the borrower is not exercising control over any of this. Um, and <clears throat> A couple more factors here uh, on on slide 35, and then like slide 36. So you're holding yourself out as a partnership. Nope. You have separate books of account for the venture that just like like the bank partnership with the with the borrower. No, the borrower had his, the borrower's own books and records. I mean, there's nothing with the bank that had the bank on it other than just paying the loan. Uh, and and again, the mutual control and and assume mutual responsibilities for the exercise um, is are, you know, are the important things. So here we are with our next poll. Today's second secret word is gift. Please select the correct secret word below. Again, the secret word was gift. Okay, the people have answered the poll that we're going to go ahead and move on now. So, limitations on deducting in business interest. So, Code Section 163 is what limits deductions, uh, basically tells you deductions for everything. And so, there's a few different provisions in 163. 
So Code Section 163D limits deductions for investment interest to net investment income. So that would be interest on you know, like loans to get marketable securities or um, loan, may, perhaps loans to invest in a C corp. Uh, might also be that um, personal interest is not deductible except for qualified residence interest. So you, you know the mortgage uh, to, to when you when you buy your house. The, uh, business interest deduction limitations, they, they used to be just related to some um, some overseas transactions um, or or for, you know, really huge corporations. <clears throat> but now the business interest deduction um, limits any business interest expense. So how do you know what kind of loan it is, whether it's investment or personal or business? You trace the interest to how the taxpayer uses the loan proceeds. And there's a special rule for debt incurred by partnerships and S-corporations. So if you think about the idea that a partnership or S-corp might borrow and then it might uh, distribute the loan proceeds to the owners, uh, this is more the case with a partnership than with an S corporation, because when a partnership borrows money, that gives the partner's basis, and that way you can make distributions to partners against that basis. Of course, we know it causes lots of problems down the road when when the partners um, have spent that money, and then and then when the the partnership re repays the debt, that's a deemed distribution to the partner, and they don't have any basis left. Uh, so that's what we call phantom income. Um, okay, but so business interest is any interest paid or accrued on indebtedness properly allocable to a business. And the rules on business interest, how much you can deduct, um, there are a couple different ways to deduct it. Uh, and I'm just going to focus on one of those. So. It's actually a little bit more expensive than what I'm saying, but um, if you want to talk about the rule of the most general application, um, the, the, that is you can deduct the business interest only up to 30% of adjusted taxable income. Uh, and then you carry it forward to a future year um, to see whether you might have bigger income in the future year. So until 2022, adjusted taxable income was uh, calculate more favorably. So, for example, if you're deducting depreciation, you know, for you know, for tax purposes, that depreciation did not count in figuring out your adjusted taxable income. So, a lot of people are going to have some some um, you know, basically a reduced adjusted taxable income base for 2022, and hopefully their income tax preparers have warned them about this, but here you go. I'm letting you know, too, that this is an issue to, to consider. So there's also an exception for a business with an average annual gross receipts of no more than $25 million index for inflation, which I think is probably around $27 million now. Um, but uh, businesses that generate losses might not be eligible for this exception. So, you know, again, they're trying to hit at you know, for example, the, you know, like a real estate partnership, you've got, you know, interest and depreciation, which causes a, you know, a loss and, and they're kind of like, all right, we don't want people to take all these, all these losses. So if you're a lost partnership, then you, you may not get your full business interest deduction. Uh, so another business that is exempt from this limitation uh, for the business interest limitation is any electing real property, trade, or business. And to be an electing real property, trade, or business, you have to use slower depreciation schedules. Now, of course, real estate does not need to have this election if it's not a trade or business because, you know, then it would be basically um, – you know, subject to the investment interest limitations rather than the business interest limitations. 
So you might you might try to say, well, maybe I'm going to posture myself so that I'm not a trade or business. Um, and there's a cross reference in this 2G21A to, to talk about uh, where we talk about whether real estate is a trade or business or not. Um, but if you want to posture yourself to not be a trade or business to be able to better deduct the interest, consider the impact on the deduction, the 20% deduction for uh, for qualified business income. So that's code section 199 capital A. And qualified business income is by definition from a business. So if the real estate does not qualify as a business, then you don't get that 20% deduction. Uh, that, that may or may not really be an issue for real estate because you know most real estate, basically people will have net losses every year between interest and depreciation and and then the way they make the money is when they sell the property at a big gain. Um, so it may or may not be as big a deal, but uh, it, that's just a consideration because it's not just even real estate you're thinking about or are there activities of trade or business. And, you know, so we can we can think about making it not be a trade or business for more than just real estate. <clears throat> um, the other thing is the net investment income tax. So net investment income tax applies to you know, investment income. And if you have a trade or business in which the person sufficiently participates, then that business income is not subject to net investment income tax. But if it's not a trade or business, then that would be subject to net investment income tax. So the trade or business idea you know, making it not a trader business may seem attractive in getting your your deduction not being limited by the business interest rules, but it has other consequences. Now, if the owner loans to a business, then the interest income is non-business income. I mean, the owner is not a bank, so uh, you know, typically our client, you know, is we're not representing banks investing in trade or business. We're, we're representing individuals or, or groups of individuals, you know, or, or businesses that, that invest in other businesses. So, so the when the owner loans to a business, the, uh, usually the interest income is going to be non-business income, and the interest expense is going to be business interest. So, if you think about a pass-through entity, you you may have, for example, an S corporation that borrows from its owner. Like I was talking about, you need, you need to do the back-to-back -back loan in order to get basis against which to offset your debt, your losses. So suppose you have an S corp and it and it borrows from its owner. So so the owners would have investment interest income, and then the S-Corp, if it's using the, the, the loan proceeds to run its business operations, then that's business interest. So so then you'd have this business interest deduction coming through on the K-1 to the, to the owner, and you'll have interest, you know, investment interest income, and they may not offset each other because the owner might not be able to deduct all of the business interest. You know, depending on these various limitations. Now, a special rule mitigates it for partnerships, but not for S corporations. As I said many times, I, I prefer people to be in, in partnerships compared to S corporations for several different reasons. Um, particularly, I'm fond of limited partnerships. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a trade or business, it's not real estate rental. So, um, so anyway, again, another advantage of partnerships over S corporations is that you can you can offset um, some of the uh, business interest expense against the investment interest income and and not have the business interest limitations apply to that part. Okay, so that's the business interest deduction limitations. 
Uh, now we're going to just talk about whether the arrangement is business or something is a, is a business or something else. So instead of being interest, is it is it a is it a an, an equity interest? So I already went through that case very briefly, where everything was a loan except for this one kicker, and it was not considered to be an equity interest. Um, if a debt instrument has a term over five years from interest from issuance and OID that is too high, the excess may be reclassified as a dividend. So what is OID? OID is original issue discount. This is under code section 1272. And and this is this was designed to attack what people call zero coupon bonds. So for example, you you loan somebody uh, four hundred thousand dollars, and many many years later, um, instead of having annual interest payments, many years later, um, the borrower pays back a million dollars, which is really principal and six hundred thousand dollars of interest, is is in substance what it is. Um, but if you didn't have the OID rules, then without stated interest, uh, there would this six hundred thousand dollars would not be characterized as, as, as interest income. So the idea here is that if you have unstated interest, as in my example, um, and, or it could be, you know, it could be maybe there are some stated interest payments, but they're clearly below the AFR. So you basically are gonna look at, um, at the, and the effective rate of interest uh, compared to the stated interest. And the difference is original issue discount and original issue discount is included in the lender's income every year. And uh, you know, kind of as the loan goes along. <clears throat> so basically if you have the stated interest being zero or just too low, then that excess may be reclassified as a dividend. Um, so like, for example, if you had a corporation that issued this debt, uh, that, that borrowed this money from the shareholder. Um, so then the, then the corporation, instead of deducting the interest, it wouldn't have a deduction and it would just be a dividend to the shareholder. That'd be, that may be good for the shareholder to have, because dividends are taxed at lower rates than interest, but you do have double taxation going on because the corporation is not deducting it, the, um, the payment against the income that generated that in, that that payment, um, whereas uh, so so there's the, the there's double taxation going on. So another thing, interest on indebtedness of a corporation, which is payable in the equity of the issuer, um, may also be non-deductible. Um, and the, but there was a a case where straight debt. Uh, which had an unknown length, somewhere between three and nine years, was not equity, even though it might be extended up to 15 years uh, after issuance. So, you know, there's, there was a lot of kind of forbearance going on that made, maybe made it look more like a permanent investment rather than a, than a loan, but it wasn't. And, and again, um, in 2G21A of, of my big PDF, We've got the um, the the authority for all these bullet points. So turning the tables, instead of having a loan recharacterized as something else, um, sometimes people might want to disguise their loan in, in, in terms of a partnership. So they make a big investment. And and that big investment, uh, they they want to call that equity, um, but the question is, is it really a loan or is it maybe a sale or something like that? <clears throat> so again, you need to have an objective intent to form a partnership, and tax credit partnerships have had mixed results. <clears throat> there have been some cases when the investors who put money in and they were they were looking to tax credits as their way to get a return and 
the IRS and the courts said, you know, look, tax credit is not an equity return. It's it's just getting your tax benefits. So this was a bunch of baloney. You weren't really an investor trying to, you know, live or die on the enterprise of success. Uh, you just were in it to get those tax credits, and and those tax credits were pretty much assured of you, and and it didn't matter whether the venture uh, made money or not. You're going to get those tax credits. So there are some cases when uh, people were denied tax credits for their investments, um, but some tax credit uh, paradigms that are in the uh, in there in the tax laws really encourage people to do tax credit partnerships and to have it be pretty nominal, um, uh, like nominal um, rate of return other than the tax credits. So my materials include a recent low-income housing tax credit case. It wasn't really so much a tax case. Uh, it was it was a case where the um, after when a low-income housing tax credit uh, partnership basically after 15 years is traditional for the tax credit investors to be bought out and the tax laws allow them to be bought out for just a nominal amount just for the for the by by simply assuming the debt and uh, and and paying for any tax uh, Consequences that there are to the tax credit investors of, of getting out of that partnership. But basically, the, like if you have a nonprofit and and the low income housing tax credit is to benefit that nonprofit, ultimately the nonprofit can basically buy out the tax credit investors and and just again just assume the loan and and pay them for their taxes on the on the on the exit. And but that's done through a right of first refusal. <clears throat> So basically, the partnership finds some buyer, and then and then the uh, low income, the uh, charity goes and says, um, nope. Instead of you selling to that buyer, uh, I want to I want to buy it out according to the way the Internal Revenue Code lets me buy it out. And in that case, the tax credit investor said, nope. I don't want to sell my interest. And I don't like the way you got your your, off, your offer. It was not a bona fide offer. And the court said, um, "Yeah, the, the, pre, the statute pretty much tells us what what that is. So, uh, so we need to go back and actually look and see what the statute requires. But, but that isn't a time when the um, investor really gets you know it, it, it works out that the, the tax credit investor typically expects." To be bought out for this nominal thing, so uh, so those low-income housing tax credits are are legit. So it, it depends on the tax credit partnerships as to what Congress intended. Also, contributions of property within two years before or after distributions of cash um, may be disguised sale from the part of the partnership, and the two years is a presumption. So. If the person doesn't get, you know, cash flow for more than two years, the IRS still can, can still prove it was this guy's sale. There's some exceptions to this rule. So my favorite exception to it is that if you have the cash just coming out of normal operating cash flow, then if it comes out of normal operating, normal operating cash flow, that cash return Within those two years, is not presumed to be disguised sale. <clears throat> but again, the IRS can still peek under the look under the hood, uh, even if you do satisfy this presumption. Uh, and so, you still need to look at the at the substance versus the form. Also, um, on the car on the corollary, if a uh, partnership distributes property um, and the partner contributes cash within two years before or after that distribution, 
that might be considered to be as a sky sale from the partnership to the partner. And that does not have the types of safe harbors that I described in the second bullet point. So distributions of cash to a partner have a little bit more lenient rule and under the disguise sale rules than um, than contributions of cash from the partner to the to the partnership. What other types of things might be uh, recharacterized? So, some people have been concerned that if a trust engages in a, uh, in a in a business, then the trust might be be characterized as a as a as a business entity. And if you do have more than one person contributing property to the trust, and those people intend for the trust to carry on a business or otherwise share investment return, then yes, that is a partnership. Um, but the trust is created for estate planning purposes. It's not a business entity merely because it runs a business. And there was a tax there was a, a tax court case um, where the court, in a review decision, uh, chided the IRS uh, for for claim for making a claim uh, that that a um, a trust that was created for estate planning purposes that ran a business was somehow a business itself. So the key is whether you have people who are, in essence, investors getting a return um, from from a joint venture. Uh, so that's the that's the rule for it. Okay, so we are going to move on to. Uh, ordinary income on the sale of a business, and we're going to compare the sale of a passive entity with the sale of Code Section 1202 small business stock and um, how depreciation recapture and the cash method accounts receivable can generate ordinary income and how to work around the ordinary income issue. So, Martita, you want to do the next slide? Sure thing. Thanks, Steve. All right. We decided that uh, these topics went together well because if you had to borrow cash from your friends or family or try to figure out all the other nuances that Steve just walked through, maybe it's time to sell your business. Kidding, kidding, kidding. Uh, but we also catch, uh, thought that, hey, this is year end. Um, this is when businesses are, are closing deals uh, and thinking about doing them. So uh, wanted to add these features in with those that have just been discussed. Teeing us off into uh, the land of uh, things to think about and, and some, some tripwires to avoid as you look into the sale of, of your business and to be able to participate in, in some opportunities that the tax code allows for you. One is uh, frequently popping up for us, which is in uh, IRS code section 1202. You'll hear people say frequently, you know, hey, is this a 1202 situation? And what what Code Section 1202 does is that it excludes some of that gain that you receive from the sale of the, the proceeds from your transaction within certain limits. Um, and there are, it's a facts and circumstances test. It's not challenging to figure out, um, but you do need to really be sure to check the boxes and make sure you're looking into how you can qualify for a Section 1202 uh, treatment. You have to be the original owner of the stock. Um, there, the exclusion, while while there is the ability to exclude gain, there's no exclusion for built-in gain on assets that are for, that are contributed for stock. Um, and then there's the limitation on the dollar amount of multiple values of the amounts that are invested. There's not a um, a state recognition. So again, this is another fact where we need to have a state-by-state -state analysis of this. And there's no exclusion for many businesses um, that you know you might have consolidated into this. We're seeing some folks try some unique arrangements, including some loans to other people who want to participate in a 1202 type of investment. Um, that shouldn't impact 1202 treatment, but do look at you know the other aspects of, of loans and 
the guarantee structures that we talked about earlier in this presentation. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit here. Um, oh, why is that doing that to me? There we go. Next slide. Buyers will, will pay less. If, if they're not getting an inside step up in basis, which is going to be a running theme for the balance of this presentation. And you can also cross-reference Steve's main uh, newsletter. We, he's embedded his, code, his sections there through his news, newsletter so that you, you can look at some details on whether there is an actual or deemed asset sale in relation to a 1202 transaction. We'll talk about this in more detail as well, but when an S corporation's assets are sold, gain or other income on that owner's K-1 increases that partner's basis, which also prevents gain on the sale of stock or the partnership interest. Again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a few, in a few slides. The beauty of the partnership, it gets that inside basis step up without an asset sale. Um, and so we'll talk about the features of these pass-through entities as we go forward. A seller finance sale of a partnership could be subject to uh, the ability to avoid capital gain tax, um, but that's only on the sale of goodwill. Um, it makes it more tax efficient than other sales. Again, we're going to hit those details in just a little bit. And then if there is a redemption, if there's a purchase by a C corporation, uh, if there's another type of redemption structure of even a partial piece of that interest, um, is less taxing on a cross-purchase uh, amongst other shareholders within a company that is eligible for 1202 treatment. So these are some features in 1202 that we keep seeing pop up. Uh, if you want some more detail on that, uh, you can reference Steve's overarching newsletter in the section referenced in the previous slide. Okay, we've got one more secret word for you today, and the secret word is interest please select the secret word interest so that you can continue to get credit. And we'll move on to our last topic. Keep clicking out there. Interest is the secret word. Getting closer, I'll give you all just one more minute. All right. So moving into our our topic for continuation continuing ordinary income on the sale of a pass through entity. I'm really glad this section doesn't have the word subrogation in it. I'll have to practice that word if I open for this in the future. Um, so this is one of my favorite topics because we're bumping into this a great deal along with the 1202 issues. Um, but we wanted to put out there the reminders on um, basic ordinary income and, and capital gain treatment for certain sales, but also some tripwires, um, both in 1202 and also if your client is a tax method taxpayer, a cash basis taxpayer, okay? So that's what this is going to focus on, and it's going to incorporate some of the nuances of the types of transactions that we're seeing out there um, and, and the consequences that tie with them if you're a cash basis taxpayer. So as you already know, um, ordinary income on an asset sale applies to S corporations but not C corporations. Uh, we're going to go into more detail on this. This is just an opening slide. Um, but that sale of that partnership interest is probably going to be taxed in part as ordinary income. You're going to see those elements of Section 1245 assets, uh, both tangible and intangible property, not including real property, or business inventory held for sale. Those will still be capital. Um, but you're going to bump it to some realities of those assets that just are, are by code never going to get uh, capital gain treatment. Then we're going to see this, this tripwire on the cash method piece that accounts receivable, if you're a cash method taxpayer, is treated as ordinary income on the sale of your business. 
So where, where we keep bumping into this is that the buyers of businesses in, in recent months, possibly recent years, are talking about getting that new basis. They want the step up in basis from the assets of the business when they, when they buy the business. Therefore, we have more buyers saying, nope, we don't want the stock deal. We want an asset deal to get that step up in basis. Over the years, we've seen uh, the, the special elections that are moving that treatment from a stock sale to an asset sale, but the documents are still titled stock purchase and sale transaction, stock purchase and sale agreement. You're seeing those elections under code section 338, typically 338H10, um, and that's moving the ability for that buyer to get that step up in basis, but keeping it a stock deal. That treatment and that election still happens, but we're seeing a shift again, which I'll talk about in another slide, of buyers saying we want a full S reorganization if a company is both a C or an S corporation. And that's where we see this tripwire coming with the cash basis taxpayer. But let me finish this one out. Gain or other income on the shareholders K-1 increases their basis in the stock when the S corporation assets are sold. So that's a good result. And an S corporation provides for tax-free distributions of its earnings, which is not available for C corporations, which you know since you'd be in a double taxation situation with a C corporation. However, we still have a situation that when an S corporation sells or is deemed to have sold its assets, that sale is likely taxed at a higher rate. So where does this come into play? It comes in early in the life of a business. Many small businesses early in their formation and, and getting started choose the cash method of accounting. Cash receipts and disbursements are good because you get to pay taxes on those in, in real time. Um, the company or the people who own the company ultimately recognize the gain or loss in the tax year in which the company actually or constructively receives that item of income and takes deductions for the tax in which the expenditures are actually made. And constructively received means that you can reasonably identify that the dollars are, are in the door and can count on the balance sheet. The other method, uh, as you probably know, is the accrual method of accounting. This is a situation where the taxpayer recogni recognizes income in the tax year when all events have occurred that establish that legal right to receive the income and also deduct the expenses in the tax year in which all rele relevant events have occurred that establish those rights. Again, a reasonable accuracy method is used there that you, you know what's coming in the door, you know what's going out, and, or you know what will go out the door um, so you can take some expenses for example, at year end, even though they might be for the following year. A hybrid of these methods can also be used. At some point, we typically see the, a company, it might evolve into an accrual method, even if, even if it started as a cash method of accounting. There's other methods of accounting out there as well, but they're industry specific, so if you have a question on those, um, we can address it or I'd already be in Steve's newsletter. So let's go back again to the basic tax consequences of selling a company. Uh, if you have the, the C corporation, the gain on the sale of the stock of the company will be all capital gain and subject to the lowest tax rate. Everybody likes that idea. And so obviously sellers in a old C corporation want that stock sale. But the buyers do not want it for those tax reasons that we discussed. They want that step up in basis. And they also might not want to take on some of that liability. For S corporations, again, the gain will also be at capital gains rates at a stock sale. So again, they're going to prefer the straight traditional stock transaction. For partnerships, we've got a situation that moves on, and I'll move here just for a second. Nope, I don't want to move on just yet. Sorry, I thought I was there. For partnerships, the gain is going to be treated as capital gain, but it's subject to ordinary income tax on both depreciated equipment which is standard, those are those 1245 assets, and also, this is the kicker, accounts receivable if the seller partnership is a cash basis taxpayer. So that's where we're bumping into this issue. Again, you're going to see a situation on the asset sale where we have the 1245 asset deal um, that you might be in part capital gains and impart ordinary income taxes based on that allocation of the purchase price among assets. 
again, you'd be further impacted both in an S corporation and in a partnership situation if you're a tax cash if you're a cash basis taxpayer. So this is why we are seeing this today. Instead of the the 338H10 election, we're seeing buyers, particularly private equity and venture capital acquirers, requiring a selling corporation to modify its tax structure to that of a partnership. They want to be ultimately buying membership interests uh, in a company that was originally an S corporation. So that is through a tax-free reorganization under Code Section 368A1F. It's a uh, disregarded type of pass-through um, reorganization of the IRS, although some states, again, have not fully embraced 368A1F at the state level. So there could be some state elements uh, that modify this analysis. But at the federal level, 368A1F allows a S corporation to convert under its state laws to an LLC and then make another election to have its tax status be disregarded for the purposes of the transaction and give the buyer that step up in basis by becoming an LLC. That sounds great. Buyer solves its problem for the step up in basis. Um, but if you're a cash basis taxpayer, that's when the backfire occurs. Even if you've done this tax-free reorganization, your status as a cash basis taxpayer doesn't change. So this is a quick um, picture up here of an F reorganization that I just mentioned. And we gave you some hidden slides that will be in the deck provided to you. You will also be emailed this, this deck. Um, so if you had an issue with it on the earlier end of the presentation, it will be provided to you in full. Uh, but the steps of the F reorganization allow the selling shareholders of the target company to become the owners of a new company. And then the target company is owned by the new company, flips into an LLC under state law, an election is made for it to be a pass-through of a Q sub-election, and then the buyer can buy the LLC interest, receiving that step up in basis as if it bought the assets. This is great for the buyer, as long as the seller is not a cash basis taxpayer. I'm gonna flip through those, those are in your deck. Again, it's this accounts receivable number that keeps coming in as a, as a big one in recent transactions. So if you're a cash basis taxpayer, it's taxed at ordinary income rates, um, but the accrual taxpayer is not. So when we have seen someone requesting an F reorg, we are seeing some pushback from S corporation sellers who are cash basis taxpayers because they're like, hey, we have huge accounts receivables. We don't wanna pay ordinary income tax on that particular allocation because it's going to be at ordinary income tax rates for us and we have huge accounts receivables. Obviously, one way to solve that, I suppose, is to get your accounts receivables down. I forgot to put that in my solutions at the end, so I'll do so. Um, but it has been an issue, and that's, if that's just the way that the business runs on 90-day terms, and it just depends on when the sale of the business is, that could be just a recurring issue uh, regardless. You're still going to also have the 1245 uh, ordinary income treatment on depreciated uh, tangible and intangible assets. Again, those are furniture, equipment, um, carpet, light fixture, patents, um, other things like that, automobiles and trucks, just not real property, unavoidable. Uh, you're going to have that ordinary income treatment on those types of assets. And then again, as we've covered it a little bit earlier, that F reorganization does not change the accounting method so you've, you're stuck in this cash basis trip wire for accounts receivable, regardless of any other elections or movements that you try to make to make that buyer happy and get that step up in basis. So what can you do? As mentioned, get down those accounts receivables. Probably a good idea any which way. But there are some options that the IRS provides if you're getting ready to sell. And that can be one, you could change your method of accounting change it to the accrual method, or there's other eligible uh, accounting methods depending on your industry. Those are few and far between, so you'd probably switch over to the accrual method. And that's under code section 481. I'll talk about that more in a second. 
You could try to use another drop-down uh, limited liability structure, which means we'd be kind of spinning out some of the assets that are desirable and not having those issues. Uh, I'll talk about that more. Or what we're seeing, too, is um, either making a payment of the portion of the purchase price be contingent on that reduction, that movement of the accounts receivable as those come in. I'll give you a couple more options and what we're seeing in practice. As mentioned, that code section 481 election is an option. You just have to plan for it well in advance of going out to market for sale, which most sellers are not doing. Um, but if you've listened to this presentation or you can guide a client if you're a broker to do so, that would be great. Uh, the potential tax impact, though, there is still an impact here because you'd be changing your yay cash is king method of only paying taxes on when that cash is in your hands to, hey, we might be paying taxes in advance of actually receiving the money in our pocket. So there are realities of doing the math, running a model that says, okay, how much are we going to pay in ordinary income taxes versus how much impact would we hit if we switch accounting methods now and pay taxes on dollars that we don't have yet in the door. So there will be an impact there. You also have to be a really organized company. Um, you have to have great books and records so that you can flip over to an accrual method. It can be done. You just have to make sure that your books and records uh, really are, are clear and able to recognize when the dollars come in the door. Probably can see them coming, um, and that would help to switch to the accrual method. But you better have a great bookkeeper or a great accountant um, who's making sure that your books and records have enough information to flip over fairly seamlessly. Okay. The other method here is a drop-down limited liability company structure. Almost sounds a little bit like this F reorg where I'm moving some assets around. But we could move uh, the buyer desired assets into a new subsidiary entity, carving out those depreciated 1245 assets if desired, and those tricky accounts receivable if you're a cash basis taxpayer. Then you've got the buyer purchasing the new subsidiary's equity um, or, or those assets directly, again, accomplishing the goal of that step-up in basis for the buyer. You might still pay taxes if you're a seller, both at capital gains and ordinary income rates, um, again, depending on how those assets are treated and allocated uh, that are subject to the transaction. Another option is we are offering this, I can't say it's been a great solution, but we're putting it out there anyway, that part of the purchase price is just paid, paid as those accounts receivable come in and come down. Um, that would result in kind of a cash basis taxpayer movement that you pay taxes on, on the dollars and on the purchase price, kind of like an installment method of the purchase price, um, but that you are still responsible as the seller for bringing in those accounts receivable. A lot of sellers don't like that idea because they're like, shoot, I thought I was selling this puppy and somebody else was responsible for the collection of these. So that's a reaction that's given. We also hear that the buyers don't like it very much because they want to really transition their customers uh, and move the business over and be in full operation versus some confusion of where payments are going, who's paying who, and who gets to keep those. So sometimes not the, not the greatest solution uh, really in any of these three categories uh, therefore, think hard <laughs> um, and long about whether or not you should remain a cash basis taxpayer when you're ready to sell. What we are seeing, and you'll see it here in this last bullet point, is a, a gross up of the purchase price is typically being negotiated if the buyer insists on that F reorganization and they'll add to the purchase price cash that's equal to the amount of the difference between the ordinary income tax paid by the seller and what the capital gain tax treatment would have been if the transaction remained a straightforward tax transaction. That's happening uh, to some extent whether or not there is a cash basis uh, taxpayer or not uh, because there sometimes is some movement in the tax treatment generally with an F reorganization that there's just some differences in the ordinary versus capital gains treatment and uh, the sellers are getting savvy enough to say, hey, cover my tax liability for that piece. Some other points that we should mention um, are just that, you know, there are, there's great planning that can be done in advance of selling the business and in advance of using any of the techniques used today. 
Um, so if I'd, I'm going to turn it back to Steve just for one second. Anything else to add on on any of these or any examples that you'd like to share, Steve? Oh, not yet. All right. We have um, a little bit of time left, so we are going to fill in, and actually I'll go back just a little bit on the F reorg. This is not necessarily a presentation about the F reorg, but since I have time and I jumped over those hidden slides, I think they're there now. Um, these are the movements of that F reorg in order to accomplish that step up in basis. So we wanted to show you the, the pictorials on these movements where, you know, day one is the shareholder, uh, you know, owning the target company. We move that shareholder into a new company. Uh, that shareholder still is in existence, but an owner of, of another company, and the new holding company is now the seller in the transaction of the target, so that the target entity is no longer owned by its original shareholders. It's owned by a holding company. And then that holding company sells its membership interest in the, in the target that's been converted to the buyer to receive that step up in basis. And one feature there on the accounting method, even though we formed a new company, there is no change in the method of accounting for the holding company. So no, no magical things happened there, if you will, in our F reorg that would allow the holding company or the target to change its method of accounting. So we still are carrying with the target company its method of accounting throughout the life of the change of an F reorganization. Then we have the ability for that holding company to make a, a, an election that basically disregards uh, the entity, the target's uh, structure in a sense, for the purposes of the transaction. And for a moment in time, uh, it takes on the ability of that 338H10 election that used to exist, uh, that still exists, but it was more frequently used, um, to allow that asset transaction to take place and allow the buyer to get that step up in basis. So this is where it ends up. Uh, the shareholders then, the, you know, the original shareholder or shareholders, they're the owners of that new holding company and the target. Look, it's still an ink, and in this case, we have to do the conversion, and we then have the ability for the new buyer to purchase the target company, uh, which is now down below here, XYZ Target LLC. That was then sold by XYZ New Holdings, Inc., uh, as, as the seller piece that was needing to be transferred. So those are some of the steps there. Um, if you're not seeing, if you're not seeing F reorgs, you probably will soon. Um, and they are definitely what is triggering some of the awareness of some of these issues uh, throughout the land of ordinary income and capital gains rates. I know we have a little bit more time. I was shocked that I finished ahead of time, so I know I have to keep us going for another seven oh, no, minutes. No, no, that's fine. That's Is fine. that okay? <laughs> you can you can look at you can look at my note to you. Um, the uh, I encourage people to go ahead and you know submit questions under the question widget. Uh, we did have a question that asked about and that you know last year Congress attempted to pull the rug out and cut Section 1202 exclusion back from 100%. Uh, to 50% or less, and, you know, what's the chance that Congress might do that? And the answer is, you know, this was not 100% exclusion when it first came in. It was it was lower in prior years, and and it's varied over time. And and it and it wasn't 100% until until the last few years. So so Congress can change uh, whatever they want, whenever they want. There's, there's no right to your 1202 exclusion if it's not in effect at that time. Now, there's a lot of unfairness and some political fallout if Congress does change that. Uh, but who knows what will happen? Uh, I, I like to give an example when people talk about you know, Congress, whether they will change laws or not. So the Tax Reform Act of 1986 was, was passed right after I graduated law school, and they had the top rate of 28%. And capital gain rates 
but the same as ordinary income rates. But the idea that we don't want people to be playing games as to whether it's ordinary income and capital gains, we'll just have them all taxed at the same rate. And a lot of pundits then said, well, I doubt this capital gain rate will stay the same as ordinary income rate. They're going to they're going to push through a capital gain tax break. And sure enough, within a few years, they sure did. But not only that, but the rate, a 28 percent rate, most you know, any any top taxpayer, uh, top bracket taxpayer would would love to have that. You know, over the years, the rate crept up and up and up and up and up. And and now, if you think about net investment income tax, et cetera, I mean, the rate is well over you know 40 percent or or even more for some of the for the top taxpayers. So you know, that's, that's almost a 50 percent increase in the tax rate, and it just crept up over the years. So if that doesn't make you think that Congress is creepy, then then I don't know what will. Uh, so we can't count on the 1202 exclusion. And the other thing is that the buyers, you know, whoever buys 1202 stock, they can't get the 1202 exclusion down the road. So the 1202 exclusion is a one-time shot for the founders, and it, and it leaves all the buyers with this uh, clunky tax structure. So, uh, Marquita, are there any questions that you would like to address? Yeah, I was making sure I hit those since I was talking too long uh, while, while those questions were coming in. I missed this column. I agree. There's there's definitely great comments out here on you know a, a buyer you know could also say no to that. Hey, don't you know gross up the the purchase price. These are conversations of leverage and business decisions. So we see those happening. Um, you know, and these are tactics for deferral and movement uh, in the eyes of the IRS. You know, there's never a no. You know. I, we have people call us and say, "Hey, can we, you know, never pay taxes?" Um, that's that's never and always. There are already words lawyers, you know, hesitate to use, but um, it's a deferral, it's a movement, um, and these are methods to reduce. Um, or, uh, as one of our participants here said, you know, is the 481 election at least it's deferring the pain? At least it defers some some movement if needed. And a lot of what we've gone over today is a type of deferral, a type of reduction. Uh, there's there's never a zero dollar movement uh, to the IRS. At least we won't say that to them. Um, and and also I wanted to address uh, Robert's point here too. Just on you know we 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 agree with your points here on on whose choice is it to you know change that that method of accounting. Someone has to pay the taxes on the shift. Um, sometimes we'll see a buyer say. Well, seller, you've enjoyed the benefit of being that cash basis account, uh, cash basis taxpayer for so long. You know, now the time has come. You can't have your cake and, and eat it too. But Robert, your your comment here is good, which is, you know, hey, if you want it so badly, you go ahead and pay the taxes on it and, and give us that gross up in the purchase price to cover this tax liability, um, which we are seeing happen a, a great deal. Um, so I want to address another another question. Here, why does an every organization avoid sale exchange? Isn't there an exchange taking place? So I brought us back to slide 57, and and what what just to take a little bit of a of a back put back backing up here, when when the when the shareholders form a new corporation, and and they transfer the their their shares in the new corporation in the in the old corporation to the new corporation, so. What happens is that what's in the old corporation is still underneath the corporate umbrella. What happens is the new corporation takes on all of the attributes of the old corporation. So, so all the tax attributes stay um, in existence. They don't change at all when the every organization happens. They simply move from the old corporation to the new corporation. So then the old corporation gets merged into an LLC. And so that on, on the right-hand side of this, the new corporation can, continues the old tax attributes, and you just have all the assets of this LLC disregard entity. They are still owned by the same taxpayer for income tax purposes. I mean, it's a, yeah, it has a new tax ID or whatever, but, but the new corporation has is a continuation of the old tax attributes. So what we're really just doing with the ref, every org is just putting all the assets into a package that can be moved over uh, through – um, through an asset purchase, but rather than all the assets being individually assigned over to the to the buyer, the 
the LLC disregard entity is assigned over. So that simply makes it easier from a legal viewpoint. But but there's no there's no getting out of the corporate structure um, that the LLC gets sold to the buyer and and the seller is going to pay tax on the sale of, of the assets. So it it's um, it's the the end of our time. Um, we may answer one or more questions after that, um, but we're going to wrap it up for those who want to get off. So thank you for participating in our webinar. Uh, please complete and submit the survey that will display at the conclusion. Um, and those of you who want to stay on and listen for a few minutes to um, to any additional questions we might want to answer are are, are welcome to to stay on. But everybody else, you're if you want to. To exit, you're welcome to do so. So, Marquita, do you have any more uh, comments about any of the questions we've had? Yeah, just some great points um, on, you know, coming through so folks can take a, a look at that. They're great points. One other question here, what measures do analysts and investors use to evaluate capital structure? Um, you know, we see the drivers coming from the type of you know deal structure proposed, whether it's an asset uh, asset transaction or a stock transaction. As you probably know, general rules are if it's an asset deal and you're taking all the good things, the price is typically higher. But we still have to look from a tax perspective at an asset by asset you know value. If it's a stock transaction, you know the analyst is looking at it a little bit differently because they're taking on more liabilities, uh, you know, with the, the full acquisition of both, you know, some, some good and some bad, or some skeletons in the closet. So we don't necessarily see the analyst um, giving a, a, a different type of value on a company based on these movements with an FRE org or otherwise. They are just simply aware of the tax consequences, and so they're proposing to their clients methods to accomplish, you know, the future step up in basis um, and the other, you know, beneficial tax features on the type of transaction depending on what they're seeing. Won't really change company valuation um, any of any of these ways that we do it. Uh, it's really kind of a tax tail wagging the the structure dog. Thank you, Marquita. Uh, so, yeah. so I, I just also want to respond to the, you know, the same questioner who was asking about Congress changing things, and and the, and the person said um, that would be totally unfair if people bought into having um, a C corp to get this 1202 stock exclusion, and then Congress changes it. And the answer is, well, um, you know, po politic political pressure may prevent that from happening, but uh, life is unfair, and and let me just. Ask anybody who's who's interested in having a, in investing in a new entity, and they and they want to be a C corp so they can get 1202 exclusion. So the question is, um, do you trust politicians? And would you like to put um, your the, the, the taxation of the sale of your business in the hands of politicians as they change from one year to the next, and things rotate between Democrats and Republicans and and you know left and right wingers? Do you want to put your hands in the politicians? So my advice is, no, I don't want to put my hands in the politicians. I, I, I do not believe in doing business as a C corporation 99.9% .9 of the time. And so our, you know, my advice to you is don't do a C corp, do a pass-through entity, um, a, a preferably a limited partnership with an S corp general partner, but there's, you know, there's several other ways to do it. But, do it as a pass-through and not as a C corporation. Uh, Marquita, do you have anything you want to add before we conclude? I echo that 100%. So uh, if if you can, uh, try going that partnership route. Try to stay inside that partnership tax code as much as you can and watch the tripwire for the cash basis taxpayer. But this is great planning. And uh, if there's other questions, feel free to reach out to either myself or Steve. Uh, our contact information is on the presentation. And it's been a pleasure spending the afternoon with you. Thanks so much, Marquita. Appreciate your, your um, participation here. You, it was a pleasure to work with you. And again, everybody, please complete and submit the survey that will display at the conclusion. And um, so long, and we look forward to future contact with you. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from you uh, sometime or, or talk to you next quarter. Thanks so much. Have a great day.